Uh, go ahead and take out your Bibles, if you haven't already. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to wrap up chapter 12 here today, and we're going to break that chapter barrier and pour right into chapter 13. We're not afraid of that chapter barrier, are we? I mean, we can go from one chapter to the other in one message. We can do that. The chapter distinctions were not inspired by the Lord. They're just kind of there as a guide. And, and so uh, today the message is called the more excellent way. And at the end of chapter 12, Paul will say, wait a minute, I've got a better way for you. And we can't stop there. We've got to go into chapter 13 and find out what that more excellent way is. And so, uh, of course, we're in, a, in the middle of kind of a mini-series dealing with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Paul is addressing a church, the Corinth church, uh, a very carnal church that's all about the signs and wonders, uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit, a uh, lot of uh, spiritual calisthenics going on there in that church. And Paul is addressing that in the, in the light of how those gifts should be used and, um, and just order and discipline within the service and those sorts of things. And so if you follow along with me in verse 27 is where we'll pick up. He says there, Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the love of prophecy, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing." And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Heavenly Father, we do come before you today, Lord, and we do desire to be on that more excellent way. Father, not uh, choosing a path to... uh, um, to give ourselves any kind of enjoyment, but Lord, to, to serve you as we serve the body of believers here, as we serve our community with love uh, from a pure heart and a pure conscience, Lord. We ask that you would help us to understand these things here today. We praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the more excellent way. Paul has addressed uh, fairly um, in depth so far the way that they're on, a a way of uh, just really being out of control as far as the gifts of the Spirit are uh, concerned. Uh, They're a very immature group of believers. And and Paul says, boy, you guys fall behind in no gift. You guys have all the gifts at work here. But, you know, that doesn't mean you're a mature group of believers. It just means that you need to be uh, taught and uh, ma- come into a, a maturity of understanding that those gifts need to be applied with love. Love is the key. Without love, you're nothing. Without love, we're just making a lot of noise in here. And we're just, uh, you know, fulfilling some kind of uh, emotional need that we might have. Without love, we're not doing anybody any good. We've really missed the whole point if we don't have love. And so it's very important that we understand that here today. Oliver Cromwell, back in the 17th century, he was kind of a ruler of England at that time. And there was a soldier who did something wrong and, and he was going to be shot. The pronouncement that Oliver Cromwell gave that he would be shot, executed uh, when the bell began to ring for the evening curfew. And so uh, his pronouncement was there and, and he knew he was going to die. When that bell began to ring, he'd be executed. Well, the time came, and uh, the bell didn't ring. And they started to wonder, what's going on? Why isn't the bell ringing? And they came to find that this man's fiance or or wife, had climbed into the bell tower and had grabbed hold of the clasper that would ring that bell and would not allow that bell to be rung. And so they brought her down from there and began to ask her, hey, what's going on here? And she began to show 
you know, she was weeping and crying and she showed the bruises and the, the cuts and, and all of the, the damage that had been done from her climbing up there and grabbing onto that bell clasper. And uh, Oliver Cromwell saw this and he said, Your husband shall live because of your sacrifice. Curfew shall not ring tonight. And so she made that sacrifice. She showed a true love, a sacrificial love. She showed really what we're talking about here today, uh, an excellent way. The same way that Jesus took. The sacrifice that Jesus made was a sacrifice of love for you and I. And because of what Jesus did, going to the cross and dying in that way, that way of just giving himself up sacrificially for all of us, we are going to live for eternity. And so... The way of love, the agape way, is the, the Greek word that we're going to look at here today. It's not just affectionate love, and, and there's a lot of different kind of loves out there. You know, I love ice cream, I, I love the movies, I love this show, I love this or that. There's a lot of loves out there uh, that we can understand. But this is a very special one that the Christians almost invented this term. It wasn't a well-used term in the Greek language. Uh, at that time, it's a, a word that means sacrificial love, goodwill, benevolence, giving. And, you know, in the past it was translated charity, and that's the Latin word, uh, charitas. And really today, it, it's not a sufficient word to, to encompass what we're talking about here. And if we just use the word charity, it, it, wouldn't do the, it wouldn't do it justice. Because what does Paul say there in chapter 13 at the end? He says, uh, if I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and though I give my body to be burned but I have not love, just giving charity is, is not love, is it? If it's not coming from a heart of I really care for these people and I really want to help them and I'm going to sacrifice. You know, our charity, what is our charity today? Man, I got a bunch of junk over here in the closet. What am I going to do with this stuff? I'm going to throw it away. No, I'm going to take it down to the mission. Here, give it to the mission. There's no love in that, is there? There's no sacrifice in that. And so really charity uh, today, it, it doesn't really encompass what the Christians believed about this word, this idea of just truly loving someone enough to sacrifice for, you, for them, enough to climb that bell tower and grab onto that thing and say, I won't let this bell ring because if it rings, my husband will die. I'll hold on to it until I die before I let it ring. And that's the idea of that agape love. The love that the Romans and the Greeks knew at that time was a very different love, uh, eros. The rarity, Robertson says, of agape made it easier for Christians to use this word for Christian love as opposed to eros, uh, sexual love, love between the sexes. And that was the word that was commonly used, and indeed it's the word that's commonly used today. Uh, if you look at love, and I, I got to tell you, I had a hard time coming up with some good graphics today, and I just had to stop going on the internet because every time I typed in love, it's like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, don't do that. Don't go home and, and look for graphics on love. Because that's what the society believes love is all about, is, is just a feeling or, uh, you know, just a... a, a a sexual connotation that goes along with it. But for the Christians, it wasn't so. And so they use that word agape. And it's the word that we find throughout the New Testament, really. Uh, it's the word agape. John fifteen twelve says, This is my commandment that you agape one another. You give to one another. You sacrificially give to one another. As I have agape you, as I... I'm going to the cross, and as I am going to be sacrificed and agape for you, I want you to live your lives out in that way. And of course, it's a very famous verse that he says, Greater agape has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And that's the true meaning of agape love. It's just a giving love. I love you so much, I'll climb that bell tower and give myself. That's exactly what Jesus did for us. Well, Paul wrote to Timothy in his first epistle to Timothy. And, and, you know, Timothy was a young pastor struggling 
uh, and, and Paul was trying to encourage him, and he says, look, Timothy, I urge you, as I urged you, I commanded you uh, to preach the gospel and just get in there and really, uh, you know, deliver the word. It needs to be delivered. He says, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. But then look what he says. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. Why did I tell you those things, Timothy? The purpose of the commandment that I gave you was for love. Because false doctrines and all these fables and endless genealogies, these disputes, they don't help anybody. And, you know, you get up there and you just start preaching a message with no love, it doesn't do anybody any good. And so the purpose of why I told you these things was for love, for the love of the people, to build them up in their faith so that they can learn how to love each other and not act as the world does in that carnal way of loving each other. Love from a pure heart, good conscience, sincere faith. That's what it's all about, Timothy. In Galatians, Paul wrote to them and said, You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. It's not just faith, right? James says, uh, faith without works is what? It's dead. Faith without love is really what we could put in there. Faith without love, it, 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 there's nothing there. What, what good is your faith if you don't love? If, it, if that faith doesn't get worked out in your life in some way. And so Paul says, it's a more excellent way. It's good that you guys want the gifts of the Spirit. It's great, you know, and it's great that you guys are, are so blessed with the gifts. But I want to show you a more excellent way. And that way is using those gifts in a way that loves people. Because right now, you're not. You're not using those gifts in a way that shows any love. You're just loving yourself in a sense. And it's not a sacrificial loving uh, way. And so we'll get into that today. The best gifts. Paul kind of lays them out here a little bit. First we have apostles and then we have this. What are the best gifts? We'll look at that a little bit today. And then nothing without love or nothing without agape. We are nothing. If we, are, if we don't have fruit coming forth from our life... In John 15, you know that, that, uh, that famous passage dealing with uh, abiding in the Lord. If you don't abide in me, you can't do anything. If you don't abide in me, there's not going to be any fruit coming forth from your life. And, and really, there's nothing there, and you're wasting your time. And so as we get back into this a little bit here today, in verse uh, 27, once again, Paul is, has been talking about the body. He, you know, he said last week, uh, you know, can the head say to the feet, I don't need you? And he gave that great analogy of the fact that uh, the eye can't see. We need the eye, we need the ear, we need the nose. In our bodies, there are many different parts of the body, but all of those parts fulfill a, a role and a, and a critical role. They all need to be there. Every one of those body parts is essential. And he said, it's just like the body of Christ. Just like the body of Christ, every part is absolutely needed. There are no vestigial organs out here in this room today, as we looked at last week. None. Every part is needed. And so he says there in verse 27, You are the body of Christ, members individually. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. And so he lays out another short list of gifts of the Spirit. Not a complete list. Uh, he's just giving, again, some examples here of what those gifts are. But these were appointed by God. Appointed by God. You know, we always think about, well, an apostle was called, appointed, uh, you know, called out, sent out, and all those kind of things. And we think about that maybe with a pastor. This pastor was called, he was gifted, and he was sent out to be a pastor. But, you know, it says right here that 
God has appointed these in the church. And he goes down to talking about the helps ministries and the administrations and, and governments and all those other gifts that are in there. And so no matter what your gift is, whether you're a pastor, whether you're a teacher, prophet, uh, whatever, whether you, you just have a gift of helps, you just want to help people, you want to do good for people, you have a, a love in your heart where you want to go help people, or you have more of an administrative gift, God has appointed you, He's called you, He's given you that ability, and He wants you to go out and use it. You're ordained to do that. Each one of us are called, it's set up, appointed within the body of Christ to do the things that he's given us uh, giftings for. And we should be doing that. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, uh, I think what we have here is more of a historical sequence than a ranking of, you know, this is the best gift, this is the second best gift, this is the third best gift. Uh, Many people kind of put it in that context. And and there is some uh, degree of, of truth to that, you know, that there are gifts that are absolutely essential for the body of Christ. Certainly we needed the apostles to go out and establish the church. We needed the apostles to go out and establish the theology and the doctrine and, and to be inspired by the Holy Spirit to write down the things that we're reading here today. And they're absolutely essential. Um, but, you know, I, I think in the historical context, that's kind of what we see within the church is, is first we have some folks going out, evangelists, apostles, Uh, missionaries we call them today and they go out and they establish churches they go into communities where maybe no Christians are and they begin to witness to people and they begin to win people to the Lord and before they know it they have a a small home fellowship going on there Uh, and then they get persecuted for a while because you know the religious organization of that area doesn't want Christianity there and and then they keep growing through that persecution and then before they know it they've got a church there in in that country or that community, whatever it is. And so certainly we've seen that historically in the church as apostles went out, prophets went out and proclaimed the word of God. And so um, I think we can see it more of in a historical context. Obviously the apostles were those ones establishing the gospel, writing down the, the gospel accounts writing down, uh, you know, so that all of us know and passing it down verbally so that we understand what the gospel is and getting that gospel message out to the world. And that's still going on today. I I still believe that there are apostles that are out there establishing churches, establishing the gospel in areas that nobody's ever heard of the gospel before because it's been, you know, suppressed by the peoples that live there. And then we have those prophets going out and proclaiming. And I think, you know, again, it's not a complete list. You could throw the, uh, the evangelist gift right in there. And, and certainly uh, uh, an apostle has to have that gift of evangelism. Going out and, and just proclaiming the word of God. Even though it's already been established there, there are already churches there, you're proclaiming that message. You're professing, you're forth-telling God's word, proclaiming that message. And then you have the teachers that come along behind them and and expound upon those things. Okay, well, I understand that Jesus came, but why did he come? You know, and and you know, they they start to talk about the need for salvation. They start to talk about uh, you know just more in depth of teaching, equipping us so that we understand uh, the gospel, so that we understand the word of God. And so those things are all vital and necessary. It's interesting, there's a verse, again, going back to 1 Timothy, where Paul kind of claims all of these gifts for himself. He says, or just saying that I I need those gifts, you know. He says, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a a ransom for all to be testified in due time. For I was appointed, again, here we see that word, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, and I am speaking a truth in Christ and not lying a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. And so again, we we see those gifts, you know, uh, just because you're an apostle doesn't mean you have, don't have a bunch of other gifts. Just because you're, you have a gift of helps that is primarily 
kind of in your life. That doesn't mean you don't have the gift of teaching and, and many other gifts. We saw in the early deacons, you know, Stephen was a man who was chosen by God as a, as a God-fearing man filled with the Holy Spirit to help in the ministry of the widows that were there in that church. But we also saw in Stephen a very powerful teaching gift, prophetic gift in his life where he was able to go out into the community and preach the word of God and have a very in-depth discussions with the Jews there in Jerusalem about who Jesus was to the point where they could not resist his wisdom and the spirit that was within him and they said, we got to kill this guy. We got to silence this guy. We have to take him out. And so it looked like primarily his gift was in the helps department or maybe in the administrations department. Uh, That's what he was chosen to do. But man, he had a powerful teaching ministry as well. He had a powerful ministry to the community. And, you know, I think it's the same today. What your calling is. There are are multifaceted uh, gifts, it would seem. And so a lot of these other gifts that are mentioned here, and I won't go into detail with them because we've talked about the gifts already in, in a previous lesson a couple of weeks ago. Um, but, um, you know, they, these other gifts are bearing witness to those initial gifts that are there. After the word is uh, proclaimed, after the gospel is established in an area, after the teachers have come and equipped, there needs to be uh, a working out of that gospel in the community, in the lives of the believers. And, and the gifts that you are given and the fruit that comes forth from your life, you are bearing witness to that gospel message. You are bearing witness to the fact that it has made a change in your life and you want to go out and share that with others. And you want to go out and help others. You want to go out and take care of the needs that are out there because of a heart of love that you have within you. And only God can do that. Only the Holy Spirit can bring you to that place uh, of just wanting to, you know, love sacrificially. I think what we clearly see here in the next couple of verses, in verse 29, he says, Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Now, you answer that question for me. Let me hear, what's the answer? Paul doesn't even have to say it, does he? The, a- the obvious answer here is no. There are many different gifts within the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit has given them to each one of us individually. Are all going to speak in tongues? Are all the apostles? Is, is everybody in this room going to be an apostle? Is everybody going to speak in tongues? Is everybody going to do those other gifts? No. The answer is no. And so why is there a teaching out there that uh, the sign of being filled with the Holy Spirit is that you speak in tongues. When Paul says very plainly right here, not all have that gift, just like the other gifts. Not all have that gift either. And so it's really an erroneous teaching, I believe. And so um, the obvious answer is no. We don't even need to go into any more detail on that. What is the best gift, though? Well, I would argue that your gift is the best gift. Whatever gift God has given you, that's the one that you should pursue. He says there, and very interesting, earnestly desire the best gifts. Earnestly desire those gifts. It's great, Paul's saying. It's great that you guys are earnestly desiring those best gifts. It is very needed to have apostles and teachers and all these other things. Earnestly desire those things. But really the best gift for for me and the best gift for you is the gift that God has given me. To earnestly desire to know what that gift is and earnestly desire knowing how to put that gift into action in my life and to use that gift in my life. And that's the same for you. You need to earnestly desire to know, God, what have you gifted me to do? What have you enabled me to do? And how do you want me to use that here in the context of of this church and this room that I'm sitting in right now. That's the gift that you've given me and it's the best gift for me. I can't be something that I'm not. I can't earnestly desire and shoot for something that 
that you haven't gifted me in. And so, God, what is it that you want me to do? That's the best gift for me. That's the gift, best gift for you. And so uh, he says, and yet I show you a more excellent way. I show you a more excellent way. Pursue those things. And yet there's a better way to go about pursuing those things. And that's what he gets into in chapter 13. 1 Peter 4.8 says, Above all things, have fervent agape for one another. For agape will cover a multitude of sins. Above all things, you've got to have love. If you, if you don't have love, you're just making noise. You're making noise. You're not doing anybody any good. Love will cover a multitude of sins. And so there we see in chapter 13, breaking that chapter barrier, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. I'm just making noise, making a lot of noise. Don't you love that when the kids get the pots and the pans out and they're just, bang, 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 bang. Well, let me see how this sounds. If I hit this one, it gets this one, you know, 40 times. And it just, after a while, you know, you just start going crazy. It's like, what is that noise? Stop that noise. It just, it's annoying. And we become like that when we don't have love. When we're a Christian at work and we're just constantly expounding, uh, you know, uh, apologetic arguments, you know, and we're just throwing out all this information that we know. And, and we've got all this knowledge in our head and we just got to puke it out on the people that we work with and we don't have love, they're just like, ah, you're hurting my ears. You're annoying me. You're banging pots together. Stop it. It's annoying. It's annoying. It's nothing but noise. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, <laughs> so that I could remove mountains, but, I, but have not love, I am nothing. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me, <coughs> how much? Nothing. Nothing. There's no fruit there. There's no fruit there. And obviously, Paul is directly referring back to what he just said. Here are all these gifts. Apostles, prophets, Teachers, hey, if I had all that stuff, Paul says, if I had every one of those gifts and I had them down, I mean, I was the greatest prophet, the greatest apostle, the greatest teacher, and I could expound on all that stuff and, and man, I got faith, I can move mountains, I give everything away. If I did everything that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are about to the T, and yet I didn't do it in a loving way, and communicate the love of God and the grace of God and the forgiveness of God to the world around me, it's no good. It's no good. It's like I'm wasting my time. And so that was really the place that the, uh, the Corinthians were at. They were using those gifts. They were using them in abundance. But Paul says, there's no love here. There's no love here. You guys are divisive. You guys are... are, are breaking up in your little factioned off groups. You're not loving each other at the love feast. You know, when you're all supposed to be coming together in an agape feast to love on each other, you know, you're getting drunk over in the corner. You're not letting the, the poor people eat. And you're sitting over there just being a glutton, getting drunk and eating. There's no love there. There's no love at all. You got all these gifts of the Spirit, but there's no fruit of the Spirit going along with it. And that is the key. That is the key. Fruit of the Spirit, not gifts of the Spirit. Context, context, context. You know, this chapter 13 is that great magnum opus of, of love, isn't it? It's, it's that passage of Scripture that gets quoted all the time in dealing with love. But we have to keep it in context. We have to keep it in the context of the fact that there is no love in this church Understanding that it's dealing with very unloving characteristics that Paul is trying to correct. And uh, I think we need to, first of all, put it in, in its context. There's a severe lack of love going on within this fellowship. Now, 
Again, we go back to those words. And I just wanted to briefly hit on these one more time. Love in the Greek, eros, was the god of love for those Greeks there. And that word is never used in the New Testament. Another like word is used in the Old Testament, but for some reason the Holy Spirit decided we're never going to use this word eros in the New Testament. We're going to use two different words, but we're never going to use that word in the New Testament. And so what we see is um, in the New Testament we have the word phileo, uh, which kind of deals with friendship, kind of more of a feeling, you know, and that's kind of what most of us think love is all about, is a feeling. Oh, I'm in love with that person. I have this feeling towards my friend, you know, of affection. I have, you know, uh, just some kind of personal attachment, a sentiment. There's a feeling that goes along with it. And we see, you know, two words there, Philadelphia, philosophy. It's just, uh, it goes along with that idea. The city of Philadelphia is known as the city of brotherly love. And, and just having a feeling of love towards each other. And so, the word we're dealing with here today, though, again, is agape. Agapeo is the actual pronunciation for the Greek there. But it, again, it's that sacrificial love, goodwill, benevolence, a giving love. Uh, and it's interesting, it's the word we get our English word agony from. And so you can kind of put it in the context of, you know, John 3.16. For God so agonized over the world. He so agonized over the world that he gave his only son and allowed him to die for us in that sacrificial way. He agonized over us. And certainly love does cause some agony, doesn't it? Love can, can just rip your heart out. A true love, when you really have a love for somebody, there's pain involved with that. There's, there's pain involved with that love. And if there is no pain... If there's no sacrifice, if there's no hurtfulness at all, we wouldn't really know truly uh, what love is unless we lose that love or, or that love uh, hurts us in some way. And so it's a perfect uh, analogy looking at the agony. Robertson says that intellect was worshipped in Greece and power in Rome. The Jews loved the law. But where did St. Paul learn the surpassing beauty of of love. Where did he get it from? Well, he got it from Jesus. He spent three years with Jesus out in the wilderness and he learned all about that love, that sacrificial love. We believe that Paul watched Stephen go to his death, a sacrificial death, the first martyr. We believe that Paul was standing right there. And we know after Paul spoke with uh, Jesus, you know, Jesus at that time said, you know, you're kicking against the goads. And we believe that Paul had this, you know, the law, the law's got to be the way. That's the way I was raised. That's, you know, I'm justified by the works of the law. But there was this nagging sense that it's not enough. It's not enough just to keep some ordinances. It's not enough. And he came to that place of realizing that it's, faith working through love. That's the more excellent way. As he realized the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for our sins. He understood that in a, in a true way. And Jesus will begin to talk to um, Peter in that way in this passage that we look at in John. If you could hold your place there for just a minute. Turn back over to John chapter 21. Very uh, well-known passage of Scripture. And it's taught in a lot of different ways, and uh, I don't want to go into all the details of it, but Jesus used the word love here many times. But Peter begins to use the different word for love, the words that we just looked at. And it's quite interesting in this interchange, if you, if you insert those Greek words into the text, in verse 14... Jesus, uh, it says there, now this is the third time that Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So you get the context there. So when he had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, it's interesting he chooses Simon Peter. Simon Peter had denied Jesus. He said, I don't want to sacrifice. I don't want to die. I don't want to go that road of pain. I don't want to go that road of sacrifice and, and suffering. 
I don't want to be identified with Jesus. And he denied him. And so Jesus begins to talk to Peter about that. And he says, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you, what, what word do you think he used there? Agape. Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me enough to sacrifice yourself for me, Peter? Interesting. Do you agape me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. You know I have affection for you. You know you're my pal. You know I really have a deep sense of you know, feeling for you. That's the word Peter used in reply. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you phileo me? Jesus came down to his level at that point. Do you really have affection for me, Peter? And then he says, Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you phileo me? Peter didn't have that agape at that point. Why? Because the Holy Spirit had not been poured out yet. We're still waiting. The apostles and disciples are still waiting for that promise of the Holy Spirit to come. And very soon after this, immediately after this, Jesus will ascend into heaven, but before he goes up, he says, wait here in Jerusalem for the promise of the Holy Spirit to come upon you. Don't even try to go out there in the power of phileo and do this mission that I've called you to do. And then we find that Peter from that point on did have an ability to love and give himself sacrificially as he went out into the world and proclaimed the message of the gospel. But you can't give what you don't have. You can't give what you don't have. We in this life, as, uh, as a natural human being, we are able to love in a, a very surface feeling kind of a way. But to love sacrificially, it takes the Holy Spirit maturing in our hearts that ability to put myself aside and to give myself in a way that is uh, the agape way, the excellent way. The gifts of the Holy Spirit without the grace and without the fruit of the Holy Spirit is kind of gross. I like what Warren Wiersbe says. Unity and diversity must be balanced with maturity or by maturity. And that maturity comes with love. It is not enough to have the gift of the Spirit and gifts from the Spirit we must also have the graces of the Spirit, i.e. fruit, love, joy, peace, etc. As we use our gifts to serve one another, the main evidence of maturity in the Christian life is a growing love for God and for God's people as well as the love, a love for lost souls. It has been well said that love is the circulatory system of the body of Christ. And I think that's very, very true. You nailed it. Maturity, true Christian maturity, is not exhibiting a bunch of gifts in a room on Sunday morning with a bunch of other people that are doing the same. That's immaturity because it's not a loving thing to do necessarily. Yes, it might fulfill a, a need within me, but it's, it's really not the agape love that the Lord is speaking about here. And so maturity comes with love. It's interesting what the Amplified Bible says about verse 31 in uh, chapter 12. It says, Desire and zealously cultivate the greatest and best gifts and graces, the higher gifts and the choicer, the choicest graces. And yet I will show you a still more excellent way, one that is better by far and the highest of them all, love. That's the highest. That's the more excellent way. That's the way of perfection. When we have the love of God working in our lives and through our lives, we're able to communicate that love to others. Not just a feeling of love, 
It takes much more than that. It takes much more than that. And it can only come as we allow the Holy Spirit to do the work in our lives. As we allow Him to sanctify us. As we allow Him to cleanse us of the garbage in our own lives. And those, those sensual passions that we have. And those uh, earthly desires. The selfishness that we have. As we allow the Holy Spirit to convict us of those things and kind of let those things go, He begins to work through us in a, in a more excellent way. And we bring forth that love that the Holy Spirit desires to see, that fruit that He desires to see. We're going to close with this. 1 John 4.16. Who is writing this? The Apostle of Love, we call him. John. Just such a loving guy. He was once a son of thunder. Uh, you know, well, should we call fire down from heaven upon those people? Now in his older years, he's just the oozing, gushy love apostle. I love John. He says there, We have known and believed the love, the agape, that God has for us. God is agape. And he who abides in agape abides in God. And God in him. Agape has been perfected among us in this. Now, I want to listen to this. That we may have the boldness in the day of judgment because he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in agape, but perfect agape casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in agape or love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not agape his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God? Whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. It's powerful. We can say we love God. We can come in here and we can raise our hands and worship Him and, and exhibit all kinds of gifts of the Spirit in a very immature kind of way. But if we don't love our brothers and sisters, we're not truly loving God because that's what He commands us to do. He commands us to do that. And you know, I don't want to criticize charismatic churches, but I've been involved in charismatic churches. And what I found in a church that exhibits a lot of those gifts on a, on a regular basis, is there's not a whole lot of love in those churches. And I know that's probably a pretty stinging thing to say, and I might get some criticism for that. But that's my experience after going to many of them and attending them for long periods of time. Because the focus is on an experience, my experience. The focus is on me. I want to experience something. And I'm pursuing a certain experience or I'm pursuing a a certain thing. I'm pursuing gratification of myself. And therefore, my focus is not on others and loving others and caring for others. My focus is on me. And as a result, when a whole church is like that, there's not a whole lot of love going on because I'm just trying to satisfy me. You're just trying to satisfy you. And we're not loving each other. And that's exactly why Paul said, I've got a better way. I've got a more excellent way. The way of love. Everything else is just noise. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we love you. Lord, we, we know these things to be true. Lord, but it's one additional step for us to put it into action in our lives. And we need you to help us. Lord, we acknowledge that we only have a a certain degree of love within our hearts in a natural sense. And Father, we ask that you would pour out your spirit upon each of us right now, upon this body of believers, upon this group here in this room, that Lord, we may have a sense of what real, true agape love is. And that that fruit would begin to be manifested here in a more powerful way in this church. 
Lord, we've had a sense of it already, but Lord, we know that we can go deeper. We know that we can go deeper into that more excellent way. And we ask that you would guide us and lead us down that path by your spirit. Fill us, we pray, 